We've been talking in this series about spiritual formation. Part of that is spiritual disciplines or the habits and practices in our lives. And as we think about how to achieve that and grow in that, we want to lay a foundation today. And so let's talk about some of the, just a couple of foundational issues. Um, the first thing I think that we want to help our viewers understand is the importance of establishing some rhythm in life, some habits or rhythms in life. So what have you learned about that? Yeah, well, I agree completely, totally agree. Um, I think part of it's my personality. I'm wired to really do well with habits and rhythm. Mm -hmm. And part of it's just life is so busy, ministry is so busy, family is so busy, you got four little kids, that I have to be intentional yeah. of just about every part of my life. And so um, I've developed a, a pretty structured rhythm uh, for like my mornings. Mm -hmm. And so for my mornings, you know, I, I get up at a certain time right. and I get myself out of bed and first thing I do, I open my Bible and I read. And I don't think there's something super spiritual about reading your Bible first thing in the morning. I have friends that do it in very different ways. Mm -hmm. I just think that for me, if I can read the Bible and talk to God uh, before anyone else wakes up, it's great. And I don't, I don't pretend to read like four chapters a day. Uh, I find myself, the older I get, to read less and less, yeah. but I spend more time thinking about it and yeah. just kind of uh, meditating on it a little bit yeah. more. Yeah, and actually, I don't even want to know the details of your plan because the, the issue is we're not trying to give you a plan. We're trying to help you understand a principle, and, and that principle is develop some habits and some rhythms in your life. Now, you, have, you said you have four young children at home, and so you probably have to adapt at times. Tell us about some of the ways you've adapted those patterns and rhythms. I imagine you haven't been doing this very same thing every morning or every evening for your whole life, right? And tell us about how the adaption process might work. Right, absolutely not. I. Mm. I I definitely have to readjust um, at least every school year and then every summer break because mm -hmm. our family schedule is different and so we have to adjust and adapt to that. Mm -hmm. Even our family devotional cycle has to adapt to school or sports. And, um, and I think the key is just to be intentional about it right. and uh, just to be open to change. And I think for me to just understand there's nothing super spiritual about, you know, reading the Bible every morning or some of my heroes, you know, they prayed three times a day, every day right. <laughs> for an hour right. each time. And it's like, right. that'd be great. But uh, <laughs> that's not the rhythm that works for my life right now. Right. Exactly. And so, yeah, I think we want to encourage you to explore different things and experiment with different things to find out what really works for you. And that you might have different, different rhythms. You might have a daily rhythm. You might have a weekly rhythm, a monthly or a seasonal rhythm. So for example, one of the things I do, uh, try to do monthly is to take a half day kind of a retreat time where I just set aside everything and have a little extended time. I can't do that every week. Uh, I, at least I, I don't feel like I can in my schedule now. And so we just want to encourage you also, um, I would say that in developing some habits and rhythms that we're, we want to address really the whole person. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about your spiritual life, your mental habits, your physical habits, you know, emotional habits. And so, so how, how do you, you know, kind of balance the different aspects of your personhood to, to cover all those elements of what it means to be human? Well, that's a, a, a great question. And you know, for me, I would say this is something that I've really come to understand better and better even recently. Just not too long ago, I realized, you know, I would never preach a sermon if I wasn't ready. Mm -hmm. I would never go and lead a meeting, especially a big important meeting, without putting in the time to prepare and get right. ready. And yet I'm quick to neglect my spiritual, emotional, and certainly my physical needs, mm -hmm. emotional and physical needs yeah. particularly, yeah. where I'll, I'll say, oh, I need some time for exercise. Then I'll compromise and right. let go of that. And so I've learned that if I'm really going to be in ministry for the long haul, if I'm going to be a healthy Christian and father and husband and pastor, you know, I need to address all the aspects of my life. Right. That's really good. And I've found that sometimes I can do double duty on that. So if I'm out, if I'm riding my bike, that's also a great time to just meditate on scripture because mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm not, my mind is not engaged in something else. So there's some, sometimes there's ways to uh, develop some habits that combine different elements. 
as well. So experiment with it, explore it. Now that's one thing that you're going to need to be able to succeed in your spiritual formation is developing some purposeful habits and rhythms. The other thing you're going to need, if you haven't figured this out already, is you're going to need some accountable relationships. Now how might that work? What do you think in terms of what kind of accountability? Who might those people be? You know, just give us some thought on, on accountability. Well, you know, let's be honest. If you're a pastor, when you think about accountability, you're thinking like, okay, who can, if I tell this something to this person about my life or my marriage, are they going to go tell everyone else in the church about it? Right? Right. Are they all going to find out about it? Right. That's, at least that's my fear. I think it's a pretty common fear. But I do think we have to have other people in our lives that we can be honest mm-hmm. with. And if we do not have that, I think that's when guys get into a lot of trouble. Yeah. And so, um, you know, my wife plays a very important role in my life mm-hmm. in terms of accountability, and she, she, I can be real honest with her. Um, but you need more than that. And yeah. so, yeah. a lot of pastors have other pastors that yeah. they do that with. Yeah. I I have other pastors who also are pastors in my church. I don't have a lot of pastors outside in other churches that I have that relationship right. with. Instead, what I've done is um, I have a couple guys who go to my church. And I just started giving them little bits of information <laughs> about my life or about things that I'm struggling with. That if it got out, it wouldn't be the end of the world for me. Right, right. And, you know, as they prove themselves trustworthy of that information, That's I've been able to point. open up more and more to them. That's a great point. So you can kind of figure out who you can trust and who you can't. It, it, that's a challenge for pastors, first of all, because we operate so much out of our role and out of our job description and our performance-oriented that a lot of times we, we, it's really hard to be then vulnerable about who we are as humans. We think that if, we, if we're not living up here, then we're going to be thought of uh, as weaker over here in the job part of it. Mm-hmm. And also, who do you trust? You know, how do you, like you said, who do you, how does it not get back to the church? Or, mm-hmm. So that's a question you've got to think through. Um, we talked in another session about allies versus confidants. And um, sometimes you have allies who have your interests but they're not necessarily confident. So you're thinking about, I like what you said about giving them a little bit so you can find the trust level Mm -hmm. and then the trust can increase over time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so find some people. One of the things I think about having your wife as a confidant, that's super helpful, but I don't want her to have all the burden. Yeah, that's very true. And, you know, it's also based on your wife and her personality and what she's Mm -hmm. comfortable with, what she can handle. Um, so sometimes with the ministry situations, I, I like having confidants or even allies who are, who are right. not my wife, Melanie, um, when there's stuff going on with people at the church and I, I, I just don't want her to get the wrong opinion of someone. Um, but a lot of personal things that I'm personally dealing with, my wife can really handle and she right. can really help me through. And um, so that's a blessing. But, yeah. but that's why it's good to have lots of people, or not lots of people, but several people. Right. So that it's not all on your wife or your best friend. Right. Um, to, to take all your baggage. Right. That, and all the church baggage mm-hmm. along with it probably. So that's hopefully that's helpful for you. There's going to be some uh, discussion questions below on the page and uh, to help you to work this through with somebody, uh, with your mentor. We just really want you to to think about these questions and apply them in your life because it's going to make a big difference to your longevity in ministry as you develop these essential foundations for spiritual, fel- uh, for spiritual formation.